Uh, for those of you that I don't know, uh, that I haven't met before, my name is Steve Knoll. I'm the executive director of TMA Bucks. We are the Transportation Management Association serving all of Bucks County. And first and foremost, I want to thank McMahon Associates and uh, Anton Kuhner for uh, teaming up with us to bring you this program. I often compare the TMA to public radio or public television, because just like PBS or NPR, uh, TMA Bucks is a nonprofit organization that relies on grants, sponsorships, and most importantly, memberships from viewers or listeners like you to grow, thrive, and provide services and information for its service area, just like the free program that you're about to enjoy. And many of you here this morning are already TMA Bucks members. Some of you have been members for more than 20 years. And for those members, I sincerely thank each and every one of you uh, for your support. You've helped us to bring federal money and put it to work right here in Bucks County, and you've helped to keep it a great place to live, work, play, and grow a business. Uh, for some of you, you are not yet members. I would like to invite you to consider joining today. I'd like you, if you would, to visit tmabucks.com. Uh, take some time to learn what we're all about. Feel free to contact me or any member of my very capable staff, which you can do from that web page. Uh, for more information and whether or not you're a member, visit that webpage regularly for updates on projects, programs, information, things going on. You can access our social media feeds, plenty of information to be had there. So, so do check it out. So with the commercial done, we turn to traffic signals. Uh, they are all around us. Seems like there's more of them popping up every single day. Uh, whether you love them, hate them, you're indifferent to them and just pay attention to whether they're red or green or amber, uh, stopping and going when they tell you to, it really depends a lot on what the signals are doing and when they're doing it. Uh, as you'll soon see, there is a considerable amount of cost, uh, maintenance, engineering, permitting involved with traffic signals. It's not a simple matter of just put one in and turn it on, uh, just tweak the timing a little bit. Sometimes that works, but there's a process that's involved. You're going to hear a whole lot about that, and it takes work. You'll see that it takes work for a municipality to keep their traffic signals functioning the way they're supposed to in agreement with the state, Set it, forget, set it and forget it is never a part of the plan. It's not an option when it comes to traffic signals. So with that, I will turn things over to Mr. Anton Kuhner from McMahon Associates and invite you to please enjoy this morning's program. Thanks again for joining us. Anton. Thanks, Steve, for the introduction. It was a very thorough introduction there on traffic signals. And I think you hit out all the agenda items, right? Really good job. Um, but. but we're going to just go through, talk about a little bit of the importance of traffic signals, especially here in our five county area, um, discuss municip municipalities responsibilities, especially in terms of maintenance, um, go through traffic signal design and permitting and the role of PennDOT. Um, we do have Tim Alashashi of a uh, PennDOT district six who covers Bucks County. He's one of our panelists here. Um, and then we're gonna go over just some equipment, um, pedestrian accommodations, and probably some of the things to come in the future. So hopefully we're gonna go through this slide there. You will have the ability to pose questions and maybe pause a little bit during our presentation to answer questions um, along the way. Um, and we can talk about questions at the end also. Uh, so we'll just get started here. Um, just looking nationally, going back to 2012, simpler times of 2012, um, traffic signals are a large part of our national infrastructure, transportation inf infrastructure. Um, over 300,000 300 signalized intersections nationally, uh, and with those costs, um, there was a national traffic signal report card completed and basically prioritizing traffic signal enhancements and maintenance um, goes a long way to improving congestion, new mobility, fuel consumption. Um, some of the estimates they made that travel time could be reduced with um, traffic signal enhancements and maintenance by 25% and fuel consumption by 10%. So it is important, as Steve mentioned, to not only identify where traffic signals are needed, but also do that 
ongoing maintenance and adjusting, especially of uh, traffic signal timings. So here in District 6, there, there are over 6,400 traffic signals in the district alone. You can see it broken down there by county, and they represent nearly half of all the traffic signals in the state. So it's one, it's a large number of traffic signals, and you can see how they can impact our, our traffic capacity and flow in, in this region. So it is important to, to maintain those traffic signals and have them operating efficiently. And also what PennDOT has to deal with as far as permitting and tracking, as well as our municipality. So there's a lot to deal with there. So traffic signal maintenance, it is one of the key parts. So we wanna hit that first. So it is the responsibility of the municipality to do the, the maintenance, you know, public works. Some have signal uh, contractors that they have on board. Um, different kinds of uh, maintenance include responsive, preventative, um, and then making modifications along the way. But preventative maintenance really is the key to extending the life of your traffic signals. It's kind of the same as if you look on your municipal roadways, you know, the longer you wait to address um, maintenance on your roadways, the more costly it is to bring it back up to the standards. Same can go for traffic signals, especially with the, the newer technology that's out there um, is a little more sensitive to, to climate changes and just changes. So keeping a clean um, traffic signal is important. So one of the guides that PennDOT puts out is publication 191. That's for how to maintain traffic signals. Um, we pulled out a couple of the uh, things here, but it is key that to know that it is there are things that should be done on six month basis and things that should be done yearly. Um, here are a couple of things that listed that on those two schedules, um, PennDOT form TE973 has a, a good breakdown of what should be covered um, annually with the traffic signals. And it's key just to keep an idea of how your signals are operating. So that goes to as far as PennDOT's responsibility for maintenance. They created this traffic signal asset management system that can be accessed by municipalities. Um, same way they have their ECMS user IDs, they can access this system also. And basically it's electronic database, has all the traffic signals in the state, um, also has flashing warning devices, identifies traffic signal systems. Um, and then also it, it's a repository for all the traffic signal design information, permit plans that can be accessed uh, by municipalities and also by engineers and consultants in the region. So that this has been a major push by PennDOT. We'll discuss it a little bit later as we go through the permitting process, how this TSAMS comes into play, but it's, it's a good source of information for municipalities for their traffic signal equipment. As far as we get into traffic signal design, PennDOT has the responsibility to approve all permitting of traffic signals and flashing warning devices in the state of Pennsylvania. Municipalities are responsible for the ownership and maintenance of the, the traffic signals. And we just listed a few of the the guidance documents as as you go through design. Um, there's several documents from the federal level with the manual on uniform traffic control devices to PennDOT publications for statewide um, referring to traffic signals, both construction and design. Um, and then also District 6 has provided some additional clarifications on um, design guidance for different applications. They're listed down there at the bottom. And these are probably things that we can um, provide to the TMA to, to have on their website, the links to those District 6 guidance documents, um, whether it's how to place traffic signal head placement at, for design and lane use control, and then also for um, pedestrian facilities, which is a, a large part of it. So 
So as part of the permitting process, um, there's a lot that, as Steve mentioned, there is a lot that goes into um, preparing for revisions to traffic signals, installing new traffic signals, um, providing a lot of the backup information um, to provide to PennDOT to make permit modifications. Um, the first part is that every new traffic signal or modification to a traffic signal re requires the completion of a application TE-160 form. Um, as, as part of that, there's a resolution that the municipality has to pass to um, submit for the application. So it involves some time, you know, the, to get to your board meeting to have that resolution passed. So there's some upfront work that has to be completed, as well as the preparation of the engineering studies, uh, warrant analysis if it was for a new signal, um, preparation of a permit plan, a construction plan, um, if you're in a system, a system permit update, and then you can see all the components there of a traffic signal design study that needs to be provided. Um, in the past, uh, the PennDOT District 6 had handled most of the traffic signal or all of the traffic signal through hard copies or electronic format. Um, in the past uh, five plus years, HOPs have transferred to an electronic submittal system. And now this year, the traffic signal plans have also moved to that system. Um, on the screen there, you can see there's a little component now in the e-permitting system on PennDOT's website that allows for submission solely for traffic signal plans. Uh, if it's a standalone project for traffic signals, you can submit it through this component. Um, if it's part of an HOP, there's a process um, how traffic signals are reviewed. There is a guidance document that I mentioned earlier that covers how this is handled. Um, but you can see there's a lot of information, again, that PennDOT once submitted through the system that they can track as part of the traffic signal. Um, this is, system is tied to the TSAM, so hopefully once all this information is provided to PennDOT, that will also be um, uploaded to the TSAMs just for the record keeping so that four or five years you can, later, you can go back to the intersection and find this information. And then that's another key part of the permitting process is closing out the permits. PennDOT requires that once the work is completed that a, a final inspection is held um, involving the PennDOT a contractor, the municipality, the designer to review that the intersection was built in accordance with the approved permit. Punch list is generated if needed and as bill plan is provided and then PennDOT requires TSAMs to also be updated to reflect the new equipment that was installed at the intersection. And then at this point, your permit is closed out. So this is a key part of once you get your permit and construction happens to closing out the permit, just so all that documentation is finalized and that helps with the maintenance with through the TSAMs um, setup. And Eric, did we have any questions come up that we wanted to address here at this point? Yeah, we did have one question come up. I did answer it, but I think it's good to bring up for the whole okay. group. And it was, um, does PennDOT need to permit signals on municipal roadways? Yeah, so that's a question that comes up often. PennDOT permits all traffic signals, regardless of whether it's on a state or, or local road. If it's two local roads, they still are responsible for the permitting. So it still would go through this process. And that goes for all, any kind of traffic. We're talking about traffic signals. It also goes for flashing control, school zones, all flashing school zones, flashing warning devices, anything that has a, a traffic control component to it is reviewed through this process. Um, Tim, did you want to jump in as far as the permitting process? Anything at this time that you wanted to bring up before we hop on the other parts of this? 
Um, not too much. I mean, I know we go to with the EPS system now, so we're still trying to figure that out and perfect it um, because of how COVID kind of changed the process. So I know Dave has been sending out community emails to everyone. Um, so if you guys ever need to just reference those or need a copy of that email, just let me know because we've been kind of always fixing it as we go along. Thanks, Tim. So we're getting right now. We'll just get into a little bit of design. And one of the things that I'd like to go over is common as municipalities, as traffic engineers, things that we're always asked about for traffic signals. So I just wanted to go over some commonly asked questions. You know, um, one of the things is I need it. Why isn't there a traffic signal at this intersection? How do I get a traffic signal at an intersection? Um, as mentioned, there's several guidance documents that need to be followed for it. Main one is the manual, manual and uniform traffic control devices. The MUTCD provides um, warrants for when that have to be met to consider an intersection to be signalized. Um, here are a few reasons why a traffic signal will go in. Um, for PennDOT, there needs to be a warrant analysis, traffic engineering study. They have a TE-150 that covers components that are to be included in it, but um, traffic volumes, crash history, physical characteristics, all those things go into consideration for the installation of a traffic signal. Um, volume is, is the key driver. Um, crash history. Um, intersection to be signalized solely on crash history is, is not something that happens. It, the crash history reduces some of the volume requirements, reduces it to 70 or 80 percent. Um, so just because there's a crash history doesn't mean the traffic signal is the most um, beneficial solution. And it's also key to understand that just because you meet the traffic signal warrant or warrants, um, the traffic signal installation is not necessarily required. Um, you really have to look at if the installation of the traffic signal will improve the capacity um, and the operation of the intersection. And again, this is submitted through the EPS system. If you're submitting to PennNOT for the warning of a signal, they'll require that the application be prepared at this point the TE 160. So there is some um, upfront work that the PennDOT is requesting, a municipality or whoever is requesting the traffic signal. Another common question is how come there's no left turn arrow at this intersection to allow for left turns? Again, this is a, a capacity consideration. Um, there are volumes, requirements, and a crash history that is considered, um, but typically the minimum minimum uh, requirements are that you have to have an average of two vehicles per cycle at in that turning movement, and then also you have to look at the opposing traffic volume that has to meet a certain threshold based on the number of lanes that are opposing. Um, and basically, that looks at is is there gaps for the left turns to make um, safely based on those volume requirements. And once you look at those, you still have to look at the capacity intersection. Um, adding a left turn arrow will help the left turn movement, but it might have a negative impact on the overall capacity of the intersection, you know, affecting the through movements and things along those lines. So that information will have to be considered when you're looking to add a left turn advance phase. Um, Types of left turn phasing is protected, prohibited. If you have a sight distance um, concern with, or a safety concern with the left turns, you know, turning over three lanes or something like that, that will where you have prohibited where they're only allowed to turn on the green arrow. Um, protected, permitted is they're allowed to turn on the green arrow and then also on either the solid green ball or in the case of a flashing yellow arrow. Um, we'll go over that. There's two options, a five section head. That's the picture that you see in the, the lower right-hand corner. Um, a flashing yellow arrow is 
a newer um, operation that PennDOT has approved in the last few years and is starting to be implemented um, more recently. Um, basically, you have the standard, you have the steady green arrow when you can turn the left turn by itself. When the left turns have to yield to the through traffic, a flashing yellow arrow is displayed and then the normal yellow and red arrow. So this just provides additional guidance that you, the traffic has to yield to the opposing traffic before they can turn. And nationally, that has shown there is a reduction in the left turn crashes with the use of a flashing yellow arrow. So this is something, if you're looking for an advanced phase, this is something that PennDOT's gonna look for new municipality to consider. Another commonly um, asked question is, you know, you get the phone call, I've been sitting on the side street for five minutes and I'm not getting a green light. Um, there's long queues, I'm backed up through the next intersection. You know, these are common things we hear. So first step, you know, making sure that the traffic signal controller, the time of days match the permit plan. A big part is does the internal clock in the controller match uh, the actual time of day? Sometimes that can throw off the timing, um, especially in a coordinated system. Is the detection operating correctly? Um, a, a bad push button can throw your intersection into recalling the side street all the time and people complain that um, they're getting stopped when there's no side street traffic. So pedestrian push buttons, maintenance of them, is a key thing. The detection operation, is it working correctly or are the vehicles stopping in the detection zone? Um, so those are key things. And then another part of it is, you know, maybe it's been uh, five to 10 years since the timings have been adjusted. Is the time to, to look at new traffic counts and update the timings? Hey, Anton, we have a question I think that's relevant right now um, from Sabrina. And her question is, what is the difference between the flashing green and the flashing yellow? So going back here. Mm -hmm. So the, for the, it is a steady green, it's not a flashing green. So if you, you drive today, you have the five section head, you get a steady green arrow and then you, you turn and usually you get a, a steady yellow arrow. So with the flashing yellow arrow, you still get the steady green arrow but then when you're allowed to turn on by yielding to the other traffic, it's a flashing yellow arrow. So it is a steady green, the green arrow doesn't flash. We also have, I think in Bucks County, 113 and route 113 and 313 is an example of a flashing yellow. We don't have too many in Bucks County right now. Thanks, Tim. One question that I've, I'll, I'll butt in here, Anton. One question that I did have uh, with regard to the flashing yellows. Um, yeah, I did notice, as it was just pointed out, the one at 113 and, and 313, not far from where I live. It's a relatively new thing, not seeing many of them in Bucks County. Um, how are they being implemented? Because I know that 113 and 313 was, uh, there was a lot of work done at that intersection, uh, new signals, new configurations and everything. Is that how these are being phased in predominantly when there's work done to the intersections? Yeah, that's what we're seeing is once you're you're coming in for a permit modification, typically when you're modernizing, putting all new signal equipment, it's something to depend on asking the municipality to weigh in on, the designer to weigh in on to consider the, the flashing yellow operation. So a new signal or a major modification to a signal, Steve, is probably the two conditions because it does require an additional signal head over the five section head. It, it requires to add two overhead heads in addition to the flashing yellow arrow head. So it does impact the mast arm itself.
So that was kind of going through, sorry, jumping back. We were talking about um, intersection operation. Um, we wanted to hit on some equipment um, that you might see out there, some newer equipment detection and probably the last two or three years has changed dramatically from when I first started. I don't want to mention when that was. Um, but mainly everything was the in pavement inductive loops a long time ago and a transition to non-invasive detection. And the non-invasive detection is a, is a changing area with mo multiple options at this point. Um, you have the video detection um, that is predominant and that can be either a single camera per approach and there's options where there's a signal camera for the intersection that can provide the detection. Um, thermal detection, um, which uses the infrared to detect the heat signatures of the vehicles. Um, and that provides a little more um, operational over the video, which can be affected by um, sunlight or shading or shadows sometimes. Um, there's radar detection that is both used for stop bar and advanced detection. Um, so there's a rapidly changing environment um, as far as detection. There's a lot of options nowadays. So it's good if you're a municipality to, to see what options there are out there and see what fits best for your municipality, both from the operation and also from the maintenance of them. Some other equipment is UPS systems and generator hookups. Um, most intersections, new intersections are looking for the UPS system. Basically when power goes out, the batteries um, come into play and keep the intersection running. Um, the battery systems can be designed for a certain amount of runtime. Typically it's four to six hours, but the more batteries, the more runtime you could get depends on your individual needs. Um, Typically it was said if useful at high volume intersections where you have loss of power, but um, somebody told me once if there's a need for a traffic signal at an intersection, then there's a need for a UPS system that should, should try to maintain the operation. Um, emergency preemption is another area that has um, continually grown. There's optical um, preemption. There's acoustic preemption, there's GPS preemption now. Um, and then also the optical, there's a wireless component too that we've seen more recently. This allows, the wireless allows you to put an advanced detector probably 300, 400 feet down the road um, to get a greater uh, distance to receive the, the signal for the, the traffic signal. And any, all these things, the, the UPS system, the video detection systems, they, they bring more maintenance on the township. Um, batteries need to be replaced eventually. Uh, detection systems as technology changes, uh, um, the older equipment becomes obsolete, sort of like your uh, cell phones. Um, so it's good to, to keep, top on, keep, keep on top of these equipment that you have at the intersection. That's why the TCMs is good. Um, something else to consider when you're at, when you're dealing with traffic signals is your, your pedestrians. They're a key to our transportation network also. So to accommodating pedestrians at traffic signals, we mainly talked about vehicles and capacity, but pedestrians are also a key component. Um, looking at the ADA compliance, um, latest PennDOT standards and push button accessibility are key things to, to consider at your intersections. APS, accessible pedestrian signals. These are the ones that either provide, provide both the, the audio and have the visual um, components to it. Um, this is something that PennDOT will want municipalities to weigh in on the need for these. They rely on the municipalities to know if these systems are needed at their intersection. So if you're doing a modification, it's something that they'll want you to consider um, when you're asking for the revision. Countdown pedestrian signals. Um, 
Again, this is a, a standard that PennDOT had adopted. All uh, pedestrian signals have the countdown feature now. One thing we just wanted to note was the use of a lead pedestrian interval. This is something if you have a high pedestrian area um, and you don't want to have an all pedestrian phase at the intersection, um, you can give pedestrians three to five seconds where they can start crossing before the cars um, start. So they would stay at red and the pedestrians would start and get into the crosswalk before the cars begin. So this is something to consider if you have a, a pedestrian conflict with your vehicles at an intersection. Um, an all ped phase would typically provide a capacity um, issue at the intersection if that's brought into play. So this is an option that you could consider. And then recently there's a um, increased use of um, pedestrian flashers for pedestrian crossings, especially at trail crossings, existing crosswalks. Um, and the main uh, type is the rapid rectangular flashing beacon below is a little diagram and then the top is a, a picture of an installation of one. Um, this is uh, utilized more. Penda has a guidance document as we talked about in the beginning where you can get more information. Ba basically, it can be, you'll have to have two side mounted um, units as well as you can include an overhead mounted unit. Um, typically, these have been found very effective in helping with uh, pedestrian crossing compliance. Now, we talked about the individual intersections. When we get into major corridors, um, coordinating signals to help the flow along the arterial is important, and traffic signal systems come into play. Uh, there's different types of traffic signal systems, time-based, which use time clocks, interconnected systems, and then centralized software systems. And that's when you get into your adaptive systems, um, the automated signal performance measures, unified command and control, those are types of systems. Um, but as you, if you get into one of those systems, PennDOT is re would require a study to be completed. Um, attached is the the TE 153, which is the document that PennDOT asks to be uh, completed when you're looking to evaluate adaptive signal systems. So just something to be aware of if you're looking at a traffic signal system or upgrading an existing system, um, just things to consider. Uh, interconnected systems can be wired with fiber optic cable or they can be wireless with spread spectrum radio. Um, the spread spectrum radio has come a long way as far as um, reliability. So that is an option. Again, this is something you should look into both methods and see what fits best for your community. Um, PennDOT likes to have the fiber optic cable in their system because their overall goal is to bring the traffic signals back to their TMC, Traffic Management Center, that's currently being built or to be built shortly to, in King of Prussia. Um, from this point, PennDOT has the ability to view a large majority of the systems in the district right now, um, both to um, evaluate the operation, check timings, uh, make timing changes. So. Their overall goal is to connect as many signals as they can to that PennDOT TMC through a fiber optic network. So if you're looking at a system, that's something that PennDOT's gonna ask you to consider is how you can bring that network, that system back to their district. And that's that would operate under that unified command and control system that I mentioned on the previous slide. So that's things that uh, come up a lot in traffic signals. And then I just have one slide here is um, what's in the future for traffic signals as technology is continually changing. Um, what's things that could be seen here 
at, from municipalities. One, they'll continually change in detection upgrades. There's going to be changes in communication um, with connected vehicles. There will be um, the DSRC communication, which provides communication from vehicles to the traffic controller, um, to other um, ITS equipment around the, the network. Um, so those are things that you might, 5G, might be Wi-Fi connections, maybe things seeing in controllers in the future. And then as connected and autonomous vehicles move forward, that's other things that you might be seeing in traffic signals. So that's all I had to cover there. We did have, uh, I wanted to note that NB did hop on, NB Patel from Penn District 6 also hopped on here. He is the Bucks County Traffic Signal Supervisor. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can raise your hand, we can bring you up or um, send it in and Eric will read it off and we can answer it. Um, we did record this session, so we can we'll post it on the TMA website, and we'll provide links to some of those documents that we mentioned in, in the PowerPoint, as well as post the PowerPoint. Well, Anton, if I could, I've got a couple questions while the uh, while while the typed questions are rolling in. Um, I've had a couple of municipalities approach me or or talk to me in passing. They have. Uh, intersections that I guess are problematic with uh, with motor vehicle accidents and issues with regular damage to the signal boxes wherever they have them placed and maybe it's a maybe it's a question uh, for, for Tim or for NB if he's still there uh, they, 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 their question to me was what what can we do to keep it so that our signal boxes aren't getting taken out every time there's there's an accident here. And you know, I wanted to be able to give them an answer that was better than, well, move it. Uh, but I don't know if there's any practices in place uh, in cases where maybe there's limitations on where the cabinets can be placed or uh, any recommendations that can be put out to municipalities and that may be having that problem. I mean, if it is a pole mounted controller, and that always uh, encourage to change to ground mounted controller and put it at, at least close to the right of way line. And if it is a right of way line is too close to the roadway, then get the signal easement from the property owner and relocate that controller as far as uh, away from the roadway. But uh, technically township is fully responsible to keep maintain all the signal related equipments, okay? I know that some township and some local government uh, face the you know, financial hurdle, okay? But that's what it is. They, <clears throat> for certain upgrades, they can apply green light go or early grant projects or other kind of state funding, you know? Yeah, Steve, that probably the best is to relocate. And as MB mentioned, some of those funding sources could be an op option to, to look to relocate those controllers. Because once those I controllers mean, go out, the intersection is down and replacements are difficult to obtain. And I think there is a certain recommendation where to install uh, install the controller box, it is away from the intersection and passing the intersection. It means that once you are approaching to the intersection, it should be after the intersection on the right hand side behind the uh, traffic signal support. So it has a less chance to get hit. All right. Well, thank thank you, gentlemen. And I have one I have one more uh, just to, to to dominate the time here. And I apologize if I missed this uh, in in taking in all the information. But uh, there was there was at one point I heard mention of 
a program where you know right now obviously all of the the signals are are municipally owned and they're controlled under state war they they're uh, maintained under state warrants there was talk of a program where the state would actually take control of the timing and synchronization of signals along major arterials uh, particularly where congestion could be a problem, particularly, even more particularly, where congestion was a problem uh, on areas where multiple municipalities may have had signals in close proximity to each other. And if I missed it, I apologize, but is there anything uh, new or advancing on, on a program like that to uh, ease congestion? Yeah, so when I mentioned the PennUts building the new TMC Transportation Traffic Management Center. Um, they're going to have a, you know, they have their look at their video cameras of all the interstate cameras they have, but then they also have a, it's called Unified Command and Control. It's a new software that PennDOT created um, that communicates with multiple traffic signal controllers. And the, as you mentioned, those key corridors, I think PennDOT's striving to get all them connected back to the districts so that they can do that monitoring and ensuring the the timings are set and then that use that for evaluating um, changes to address congestion so uh, i don't know how many quarters are on there now i don't know mb tim do you know I, how many and also we have a the timing contract with the uh, um, john alpac right so time to time, we do the time uh, certain corridors. Uh, recently, we did a street road retiming corridor, and it is we see we saw some improvements on a progression. Okay, now we are doing county line retiming, also Cheltenham Avenue retiming, and um, in a Bristol County, we are doing. Um, Bristol Pike retiming. So we, that is another option we have that certain corridors we can retime to improve the progression. I think I don't know this answer your question or not, I'm not sure. But we do have certain uh, contract available for the retiming of the corridor. It, it does. I, what I realize is, is number one, I, kind of, I, I did kind of miss the answer to my own question there. It, it, it slipped under my radar a little bit. Uh, but that, you know, thank you for expanding on things a little bit with, with regard to that and uh, helping us to better understand uh, what's being done there. There's there's a whole lot of potential and I look forward to seeing it uh, get taken advantage of. And now I'll, uh, I'll go back muted because I see that there's a couple of questions that have come into the chat box. All right. I can go ahead and read the, the question that came in. So the question is, PennDOT and other entities are pushing more multimodal transportation. Bicycle scooter users often navigate hazardous intersections because traffic signals are not necessarily designed for them. Are there PennDOT projects or initiatives being developed to help balance different forms of traffic through intersections? I'll do my best to answer this one, but I, I agree with you that as far as intersection design, um, covering those other multimodal uses is is lagging a little bit, but I, I believe that PennDOT as a whole, as central office is developing guidelines for how to merge those two um, uses, the track uh, vehicular demands, as well as the pedestrian and bicycle demands at intersections. I think you've seen that more recently, um, as I mentioned in the presentation about the ADA requirements at intersections. Um, the pedestrian push button accessibility and uh, countdown timers. I think it's moving in that direction, but um, I do believe there are guidelines coming out and we can look and provide an answer after um, the presentation. I can do a little more research for Steve on that.
Was there any other questions, Eric? That was the only one that we had so far. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, Steve, if you can always yeah, follow it, up it, with it, questions it, afterwards, I'm sure Steve would forward of, them on. Of questions is always a sign of a presentation well delivered. So, congrats, so congratulations. Uh, but if there, again, we try to, uh, to to take care of these sessions as, as quickly as we can. And I, I want to thank uh, Anton, Eric, uh, Tim, NB, and others who participated in uh, in today's event. Uh, we at the TMA, this is this is the first of what we hope will be a regular series of uh, short yet informative seminars uh, for the benefit of, of our members and for the general public. Look for more information. We're already working on one uh, coming up in December. So we do aim to make these an hour or less something that you can uh, you get in on your work day. And again, as I said before, uh, tmabucks.com is our website. As Anton indicated, we'll be putting this, uh, a recording of this up on the website so that you can view it, catch anything that, uh, that you may have missed just as I missed something earlier. See, always good to ask questions. Uh, but with, with that in mind and having said that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today. And uh, we will uh, have more information out on an event upcoming sometime around Christmas. So thank you and uh, enjoy the day.